Well, welcome everyone. As I, I think that you are aware, our uh, theme today is uh, caring for the Lord in others or, or caring for the neighbor, which as we'll see is really caring for the Lord. And um, we'll start by reading our, our story here from Matthew 25, verses 31 through 36. This is a, a parabolic description of Judgment Day. And, um, you know, the Lord gathers the, the good people, the sheep, and he tells them that, that he's been hungry and they fed him, he's been thirsty. thirsty. And, um, of course, the, these are the ones that are able to enter into his kingdom. So, um, anyway, let's, let's begin by looking at uh, reading the story. But first, oh, wait a minute, let, let me talk to you about my task. Um, uh, I set myself the task of uh, putting the Lord's words into context to begin with, and um, looking at the general meaning of, of our section here, 31 through 46, and then looking at the Lord as the object of charity, which the very to talk about, and then, and then we'll touch on those there's first three groups, the hungry, the thirsty, and the stranger, the sojourner. And uh, Eric is going to take up the last three um, groups that the Lord mentions. Um, I, and I, I'm hoping Eric will really uh, sort of do repair for me because I'm going to focus a lot on the generals and um, maybe not get into the specifics as much as, as he does. And Karin and Fritz, too, I, I'm hoping will really flesh out the idea of, of what it is to, to care for the neighbor. But anyway, first, let's start with the, the, um, our verses here from Matthew 25. And I have five readers lined up, and uh, I told you what number you were. Uh, there's a little number at the bottom here, as you see one. And Sue, I think you're the uh, number one. Did you read? And when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory, and all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a sheep oh, sorry, as a shepherd divides sheep from the goats, and he will set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom, prepare for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a sojourner, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a sojourner and take you in, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. And then he will say to those on the left hands, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a sojourner, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. I yes, the yes. <laughs> then they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did that not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment put the righteous into eternal life. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Okay, well first I want to talk a little about the context of this, because as you know, the Lord's Word is, is one piece, you know, a seamless garment, and uh, everything that's there follows on from what went before. And this whole chapter obviously is linked together for a, a spiritual reason. So Matthew 25 has three different parables in it. Uh, we just read the last one, which is sort of a parable, a parable of description anyway, of Judgment Day. Um, but uh, the first story in Matthew 25 is of the wise and the foolish virgins. And the second one is of the, the talents that were given to the three men uh, which they uh, were given to invest in, in the sheep of the hills. So I, I think these are all a piece, and we'll just look at a very, very general way. Uh, they're all uh, about judgment after death, aren't they? And um, all of them present uh, our work alone, because the wise and foolish virgins, you remember, they were invited to the, the wedding feast, and they waited and waited, the bridegroom was delayed in his coming, and they slumbered and slept. And it's all about what happens in this, this waiting period, uh, which, of course, is, is pregnant about our own state in the world. And then the talents. Uh, the the um, landowner goes into a far country, the merchant, and he leaves uh, investments with, with three people. And they have to invest while he's gone, and then he comes back, and, and they have to give account. And then the sheep and the goats, uh, the, the parable here where... Uh, they're left to uh, serve their neighbor, and some of them do and some don't, but they don't know that the Lord is really the one who they're serving. So, yeah, um, the main image with the wise and foolish virgins is oil, right? The, the, the prudent virgins have brought oil with them in their lamps so that they have some even when the bridegroom is delayed. And so they're able to enter into the marriage feast. Uh, what's the main Im image with the talent? One. They've traded. The summer, They've the traded. Summer. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it's the talents themselves, right? And the mm -hmm. trading, mm -hmm. yeah. And so talents, you know, they would be um, silver talents, right? Um, and uh, so what would they bring to mind? Truth. Yeah, truth. Right. Knowledge and, and truth that they have to engage in and work with and develop. And finally, the sheep and the goats. Uh, what, what's the main uh, import of the story? What is the Lord asking for? Action. Action, yes. Yeah, they have to do it. What have you done? You know, yes, you've done it to me. You haven't done it to me. And so, yeah, we're looking at works and action. So, look at that. You know, we see... Um, judgment as to affections, judgment as to thoughts, and judgment as to deeds. And, you know, you have the classic will, understanding, and action, the three main parts of our lives, uh, of our minds and lives. So, yeah, um, it, it's also a little interesting to look at who the Lord, how the Lord is portrayed in each one of those. The first one, he's the bridegroom and the host, you know, invites to the marriage supper. And, of course, that and beautiful, and <coughs> Dave mentioned that marriage in his talk this morning. Uh, it's all about the marriage of good and truth and the invitation um, to, to enter into the Lord's love and joy. And uh, the second parable, the Lord is the merchant and the investor, and he wants us to work with those truths that he's given us and develop them so that um, at the end of the day, we can enter into the joy of our Lord. Um, and finally, in the last one, we see how the Lord is the Son of Man coming in his glory. He's the shepherd gathering his sheep, and he sits as, as king and, uh, and judge uh, over us. So anyway, just a, a general contextualization. You can see how there's purpose and order and how the Lord has brought this all together. I'm sure much more could be understood and, and said. Anyway, back to our, our story, our parable. So the Son of Man, coming in his glory, uh, gathers the sheep before him uh, as a king and shepherd, and uh, then he speaks, 
right? The king will say. Um, in, in the spiritual sense of the word, every time the Lord says, or the person representing the Lord, that represents his inflowing, you know, his getting our attention, his addressing us, right, with his life. And so I think what we see here in general is the Lord addressing his sheep. That's the influx. And he talks about um, how they fed the hungry and the thirsty and, and done what he's asked. He's talking about their response to him. And then they, the righteous, answer him. And they ask these questions. And what we see here is a, a kind of exploration. And I think this is descriptive of what the writers call the state of vastation. Do you know what vastation is? It, it's not an English word. It's sort of pulled over from the Latin, and, and translators have often just kept it as vastation. Like a purging. You, what's that? Like a purging. Yes, yeah, it is yeah. a purging. And literally, I, I like the word stripping, which some more modern okay. translators have used, because it's a, a stripping away after death of all the things that really aren't a, a core part of our character. And the beautiful thing for good people is that all the, the things they've struggled with, the, the faults, the bad habits, they're able to come to a, they're able to explore in that greater light in the spiritual world. And they're able to uh, come to realizations about these things and let go, give, give them up. So, anyway, I think that's what's described there and they're saying, Lord, when, when did we? Um, and, of course, the Lord, the answer is uh, from the Lord. The king will say, truly, you know, you've done this to my brothers, you've done it to me, we're connected. And so I think that's the, the joyful affirmation and, and conjunction with the Lord that, that follows. And then the Lord addresses those on his left hand, those who are in truth without good. The right hand is the, the good so that's the Lord's influx being rejected and the response that, that those who reject have. They, they haven't fed the Lord or his people. And again, uh, they answer and a question, and that is the devastation and the exploration and the coming to realization that this is what they love, this is what they've chosen. And and the judgment to follow. He will answer them. Truly, as much as you didn't do this to one of the least of these, my brethren, you didn't do it to me. And finally, he's going to everlasting punishment and the, the righteous into everlasting life. And that's the imputation. Imputation is the assigning to us after death of what we have chosen uh, in its final form. So, again, you know, I'm just giving you sort of an overview context of, of our story and um, I think what, what it's talking about. Moving on now to um, the more core point that we're going to focus on, uh, the Lord said, I was hungry, thirsty, and you. Um, so, so what is the main idea here? What's the burden of this? I guess. To, to help your neighbor? Yeah, we, we are to help our neighbor, and who is our neighbor? Everybody. Our neighbor is everybody, and uh, yet we're to understand that we're especially the Lord, Lord. that the Lord is our neighbor. Oh. Yeah, and that it's the Lord in others that we are to love. Um, so, so we read in the Heavenly Doctrine, uh, the Lord is the neighbor in the highest sense, and in the fullest degree, and the origin of neighbor. Hence, it follows that so far as anyone has the Lord with their self, so far they are the neighbor. So far they are the neighbor. So when we love the neighbor, we're loving the Lord, and we're loving the Lord in them. Um, so, yeah, the, so the message is that charity is directed at the Lord himself in other people. Now, Louisa, we're going to get back to you because in a way this can be confusing because well, we're supposed to love people and that's not, that doesn't seem like it's the same as loving the Lord. But we'll, we'll get there. So, we're, we're supposed to love the Lord. Let's explore this a little. Um, who, who, what is the Lord himself in others that we are to love? Who is the Lord? What is the Lord? 
The Lord is good. What is his What is his essence? The writings teach. Love. He is love. True. And um, uh, what we love we call good. So the writings sort of equate love and good. And the Lord is truth. And the Lord is truth as well. And he is wisdom, right? And truth is the stuff of wisdom. Yes? Presence, omnipresence everywhere. That, that describes what the Lord, the Lord is, yeah. His love and his wisdom, what he is, is present everywhere. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So, um, yeah, core teaching in the work Divine Love and Wisdom. The divine, this is right at the beginning here, 28. The divine essence, in its, it's the divine essence itself is love and wisdom. For these two are the essential ingredients of all aspects of a human being. Um, it starts out, love is the life of a human being. It goes on to say, well, love and wisdom, because wisdom gives form to, to that love and it helps it express itself. So, is this, is this all? The Lord is love. The Lord is love and wisdom. Is the Lord anything else? According to the writings? You guys put on your writings cap. You've heard this many, many times. The Lord is love and wisdom. Into use. Into use, yeah. And, and the series in Divine Love and Wisdom goes on to say there are, you see this is just a few passages later here, well, a hundred or so, um, there are three elements in the Lord. There are three things in the Lord which are the, which are the Lord. The divine of love, the divine of wisdom, the divine of use. So the divine elements love, wisdom, and use. And expressed maybe a little more clearly in, in the work Marriage Love. Uh, love, wisdom, and use. These are the three essentials which together make up the divine essence. So, yeah, love and wisdom are in a way say it all. Love says it all. But love needs wisdom to give expression to itself and to help it work. And love and wisdom imply use, because the Lord doesn't rest there in love and wisdom. He always engages. He always brings that love and wisdom to others and works them in others. And that's the use. So, so what is the Lord? He's love and wisdom and use. Yeah. Charity is directed to the Lord himself and others. Um, what is the Lord and others? It's love and wisdom and use. And these what we are to love and to nurture. And other people. So, why is it important to think that loving the Lord is the best way to love our neighbor? What, what, what does that idea give birth to? What, why is that an important thing to, to uh, know? Yes, Louise? Is it because if you just love someone without uh, using teachings about how to do that properly, then it really isn't much good at all. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Something else? Anyone else? Yeah, yeah. Because we can't see people's insides, that, that inner reality, their spiritual life. Mm -hmm. So we need to turn to the world for help because we can't see mm -hmm. other people's Is it um, because the hold on we, um, be, because the the neighbour is our Lord, and when we love our neighbour, it's a confirmation of, the, of of oneness of unity that joins everyone together. There's no separation. Yes, yeah, that's, no that's a beautiful consequence. Is it the it? Lord or the neighbour? It's all one. Yeah. Yeah, that's a beautiful thought, that when we're, we're really engaging with a neighbor, we're engaging with the Lord, and that's drawing us all together. Yeah, that's lovely. Yes, sir? We don't, everything that we experience is delightful to us, so it's hard for us to know what's really a good love and what's a selfish love. And so when we think about the Lord and His love, that's a very specific quality <coughs> that we are to love in others. Mm -hmm. Um, can we love things in others that are not the Lord, that are not 
Yeah. We can. Loving, yeah. And wise and useful. Yeah. <laughs> Things for our own advantage. Yeah. What What happens when we do that? Uh, are we helping another person if we're loving in them what's not from the Lord? Mm. Yes, Connie. We can have compassion on it. We can have compassion on it. Yeah, we can have compassion when we see that something from the Lord is not there. Right? Yeah. Yes, John. But how, how, how does this relate to that we shouldn't make a spiritual judgment of our neighbor? Because how do we know whether the Lord is actually present in our neighbor? Let's assume everybody is present in everybody. But we don't really know how much is there. So should we not just assume that there is some of the Lord in our neighbor, whatever their external behaviors mm -hmm. might be? We, can, we can't make the spiritual judgment. We can only make the worldly judgment. Yes, yeah. There's a passage that I just read a few minutes ago, which I know Eric points out in his, his book, uh, which, which basically says, um, you know, here are all the kinds of the neighbor referring to our Matthew 25. Uh, but the Lord doesn't expect us. We, we are meant to try to discriminate you know, who, who the neighbor is that we're serving. But the Lord doesn't expect us to know, you know all the kinds of the neighbor. Did I, did I say that right here? Um, so, so yeah, he, he only works with, he, he appreciates what we know what we're, we're working from. So, so no, we, we can't know for sure the state of our neighbor, but we're supposed to try. And that's what, what this whole thing is about, really, is, you know, what is our neighbor hungry, thirsty? You know, what, what, what's the state of our neighbor? And what are we trying to do to help them? Yeah. So it's about discernment. Yeah, so we have to develop our discernment, humbly recognizing that we can't know for sure. But one, back to you, John, though, um, what do we know, even about the most wicked slob that may be standing in front of us? What do we know about them? What is from the Lord? <laughs> the, Lord asked, the Lord created them to go to heaven, right? And so they have the potential within them. And so that, that potential is never wiped out in any human being. Their freedom and their rationality are protected by the Lord like the pupil of his eye. Right, right, so they can never destroy them. And so they always have the ability to turn and live. And uh, so that's what we're loving, is that potential. Mm -hmm. How can we bring that potential out? How can we foster that, that potential? Well, before we get into that more, because that really is the focus, I, I want to just turn to a couple of the general things that the writings say about these six categories, which are kind of surprising in a way. One passage says, in these six kinds of good are comprehended all the genera of the neighbor. All the kinds of neighbor are, in general, summarized by these six. And it says, kinds of good. Wait a minute, hungry, thirsty, sojourner, uh, sick, good? Again, you know, it's, it's, it's they, they, those categories represent a goodness that we're looking toward and trying to serve even if it's potential. Another statement. Uh, these works signify the universal genera of charity and in what degree are the goods or good people who are neighbors toward whom we are to exercise charity. So there are levels, right? And they're somehow expressed in these six. Finally, uh, these are the very works of charity in their order. These describe charity such as in its essence, and describe the exercise of charity such as it must be in its life, the life of our exercise of charity. Now this is kind of confusing because, you know, here we look at hungry, thirsty, sojourner, naked, but what about orphans and widows and the lame and the halt and the, the blind and the leprous and the afflicted? Um, Swedenborg says that all of these categories were kinds of the neighbor that, that in the most ancient, in the ancient church, they, they would analyze their neighbor and say, what am I serving here? Is, it, is this person lame? Is this person blind? 
So, so there are all these different categories, and somehow these all must fit into those six because they represent all the genera uh, in general. Uh, but anyway, we're not going to go into that, but uh, something to keep in mind. Maybe, maybe you guys will touch on some of these categories because they're all very useful. You know, how's that person deaf? How can I help them here? Anyway, just giving you a couple of, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but um, giving you a couple of ideas how maybe the order and uh, genera of charity are expressed here. So it, it seems like uh, hun hungry and thirsty, we've got a clear, good, truth uh, polarity here. You know, food represents goodness uh, that nourishes and delights us, and, and drink represents Let's come out here. <laughs> what that do? The Lord clearly doesn't like what you're presenting. Yeah, so hungry and thirsty. Sojourner naked, I think that works, and, and sick, and in prison. Uh, the prison is the falsity, and the sickness is the evil. So, by contrast, good and true. And, you know, one thing is interesting is that when you look at the heavenly and spiritual levels, um, those are the heavenly proper levels. And there's nothing wrong with being hungry or thirsty or, or even a sojourner and naked, right? But being sick and in prison are, are more problematic states, you know? And so I think the natural is the part of us that gets turned upside down and creates evil. So I think there's a sort of a, a logic there, too. But here is one that someone else has suggested uh, that also makes some sense and fits in with something else the writings say. Uh, hungry, okay, the love side. The hungry are those, in general, desiring good. Thirsty, those desiring truth. And the sojourner, those who are willing to be instructed, you know, willing to know. And so we have kind of a trine there, uh, celestial, spiritual, and natural. And uh, then they fit, fitted the naked in here, having nothing good and true. And then the sick, those in states of evil and prison, those in states of falsity. And the one thing the writings do say very clearly is that these three represent people with good desires. And these represent people who are open in or aware of uh, negative, negative desires. Or to put it more in the terms of the writings, these are people in the affection for good and true, whereas these are people in states of self-acknowledgement, acknowledgement that the character of self left to itself, which is that they are naked and sick and, and in prison. So we need the Lord. Um, so anyway, Eric is going to be working with these more difficult states and we'll touch on, uh, on these states. Any, any thoughts or questions about this? This is theory, you know. Okay, I'm, a, I'm an academic. Forgive me. I think what's challenging me is relating the spiritual to the natural. Yes. Uh -huh. can I, can, you I can see elaborate? what you're saying in the, the sort of the heavenly state. Mm -hmm. But um, I think people who are coming to this maybe for the first time and see you put a slide up which says sick people are an evil without <laughs> actually understanding oh, I see. the yeah. sense might yeah. have a bit of a challenge there. Oh, of course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're talking about spiritually sick, aren't yeah. we? Yeah. I think that's important to emphasize. Yeah, for, for sure. <laughs> I guess I'm making some assumptions here about my crowd. <laughs> For sure. Oh, yeah, and I, I didn't add, but yeah, so, so I had mentioned that maybe there's a celestial, spiritual, natural, uh, celestial heaven being those who are with, with whom the good uh, dominates, and spiritual, those who are in, uh, engaged with their understanding, and the natural, those who are, tend to be stuck more in, in their knowledge. Um, and, by contrast, this might represent the highest hell, and uh, those in the middle of hell city predominates, and the lowest hell. So, anyway, you see an order here. 
that fits in with other uh, paradigms of the writers. So, so anyway, moving on, the, um, in general, the idea is that we need to work, uh, love and work with the good and the true and the useful things from the Lord in others. And so the question is, you know, what, how do we do that? And, and what does that look like in our thinking? You know, how, how do we think about that in relation to the people that we deal with? And we've sort of, we've done a little of this already. Any thoughts on that? What, what are we looking at when we look at someone, you know, um, who's just dropped a plate and the plate has shattered? Okay? How do we love and care for that person? What are we looking to? What's, the, what's the Lord in them? That help we, them. You know, why do we want to help them? So How does it relate to the Lord? They might feel guilty. Yeah, and their the shame, 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 shame there, guilt. Um, mm -hmm. And what does the Lord want for them? Well, not to feel shame that that wasn't a, you know, yeah. you want to see that. Yeah, so, so this, it, it, the Lord doesn't want them to feel that way, and they've lost that potential. So, how do we help restore? Yes, Sue. Okay, I mean, the first, really, I mean, it, that fits in the character in the same category, doesn't it? If somebody trips over on the pavement, it's a sort of a matter of embarrassment and yeah, having yeah. to sort of reassure them that that type of thing happens to yeah. all of us, doesn't it? We might just not be in court, really. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so the yeah. way, you know, if, if we sh jump on them with blame and, you know, mm -hmm. like a parent is, is apt to do with a child or something that does that. Mm -hmm. uh, talking about myself. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, with the hand-painted periwinkle. That's not always know. very helpful, is it? Um, it doesn't really help the child recover from that when we jump on them. Um, or, or anybody, right? So, so how do we behave with another adult? <coughs> kind to them, we, we um, sort of uh, handle it lightly and we help them get up and um, make a joke out of it or, or something to diffuse that that state of shame and, and guilt. Now it's different if they smash the plate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, well that's a good example then. Um, what if, um, okay, uh, I, thought, I thought I had one that, uh, well, okay, let, let, let me go back then. Put, take that one off the plate here. So, so what if they, what if they've smashed it? Well, you can still help them because they are obviously angry about something and so you can, hmm help them if you're... Yeah, and that's a very different state, yeah. isn't it? And, yeah. and we're apt to... Uh -huh. um, yeah. Are we going to praise mm -hmm. them for smashing it? <laughs> no. no, we're not going to praise them for smashing it. But I guess it depends if it's your best plate that they've just smashed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But sure, surely that's a, the smashing the plate is a indication of frustration. That's it. So really you need to try to investigate with them why they're frustrated. Yeah, yeah, the anger and get behind that anger and frustration to try to help them, you know, come into a new state yes. and maybe a state of realization about their, their anger and frustration so that they can get beyond that, right? So yeah, we're looking at the Lord in them. Um, yeah, and just another example. So what about someone who's, who's lost a dear friend to cancer? Sad. What are we loving? What are we caring for? Their anguish. I agree. That's what we're seeing, and that's what we're yes, and that we're empathizing. That. With. And I believe that as well as trying to help them spiritually be okay, we have to do it practically mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. We have to, mm -hmm. I think, think on two planes. We have to think very materially very naturally, mm -hmm. but also hope that you can help them spiritually to understand why things happen. Mm -hmm. But then you just said earlier that we, we don't know, only the Lord knows, so mm -hmm. I'm confused. Well, you're, you're describing very useful um, 
you know, strategies, you know, or thoughts that we could have in approaching that. Here, I'm, try I'm just trying to look at how is this loving the Lord? How, how is what we're doing for that person in anguish, uh, the sympathy we are, how, how are we bringing out the Lord? How are we loving the Lord? In, are we showing in him that we are really trying mm -hmm. to do what he wants us to do? Mm -hmm. Yes. So that every time we help that's somebody. Between, so what you're just saying is between us and the Lord is we're showing him something, we're, we're demonstrating that. But, but how are we loving the Lord in them? How are we caring for the Lord in them? What is the Lord in them? Is it perhaps the love that person feels for the, the one who passed away? Yes, the Lord loves them and is um, wanting them to um, get beyond their sadness back into a state of peace and joy, right? Um, and he's wanting to use that state uh, in a useful way to, because that's a state of love, isn't it? And he wants to develop that love, that, com that compassion in them. Yeah, maybe by giving them time, I mean, being there for them, but giving them the time is mo mo much more important than telling them all the wise things, because mm -hmm. they're not uh -huh. able to listen to the wise yes, things. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and that's letting the Lord work, isn't it? That's and it. It's, it's, it's letting Lord the Lord be present in that state. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was just thinking, what happened if they were so angry that they actually dropped the plate on you? Would then be sort of loving the Lord, would that be to, say for example, if they really hate you, call the police and let them deal with it and just remove yourself from the situation? Because mm -hmm. there's nothing you can do. Yeah, that, that's, that's one strategy. Um, so I, we're, we're going to get into strategies, I think, but I guess I'm just trying to make a general point that what this is all about is loving the Lord in them, and the Lord is that state that alone can bring them happiness and blessing long term, for sure. And so that, that's really what we're going for, is how can we bring out what the Lord's trying to do with them. Um, yeah, so, you know, again, it would, any, any example we look at, someone struggling to figure out how to put a project together, say they're struggling, what do they need? Help. Well, they need help, yeah. What kind of help? And I think sometimes they just need somebody to talk to because helping is not always, I mean, you don't want to give them practical help right no. because they can do it, but they just need somebody to talk, yeah, talk yeah. to. Yeah, that, that can be a wise strategy. If, if we are knowledgeable in how to, we might, you know, help them with that or help them find sources for that. Mm -hmm. So this one's more a little bit on the knowledge side, but again, the point is, how do we help them come into a state in which the Lord can be present? How do we serve the Lord in, in working with that person? Again, just another example, feeling someone feeling unmotivated and uninspired. Mm -hmm. uh, what does the Lord want them to feel? And how, how might we, what, what's a general area that we might look to to try to get the Lord, help the Lord with that person? Yes, Carmen. So, in essence, are we saying we are supporting the person to be more receptive to the Lord? Yeah. So yeah, that their sure. state changes, and in that change of state, they are more receptive to what's coming in from above. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's a very interesting perspective, Carmen. Um, I have a good friend who just lost his wife to cancer. I know someone who's struggling to figure out how to put a project together. I know someone else who's feeling unmotivated and uninspired. I know they're angry. I'm not angry. Why do you assume I'm taking a break? Cat fits. So there are a long way from being. Well, in my judgment, perception, should I just say, in my perception, yeah. they're a long way from being ready for mm -hmm. 
spiritual inspiration. And isn't, that, isn't that why it requires so much wisdom? Mm -hmm. You know, people can be so wise in how they help others. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the wisdom is in waiting. It's very important to be present with this yes. in that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I chose this one because I was thinking. Um, oh, I did it again. Um, I, I chose this one because I was thinking particularly of use. You know, trying to bring out uh, the use. If someone's feeling unmotivated and uninspired, sometimes giving them opportunities or finding ways for them to engage, like um, Andreas, I'll bet you do this with your daughter sometimes. When she's out of sorts, you try to get her involved in something fun or useful or... Uh, Interested, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I think you look at when... You, you provide when, opportunities. Yeah. Yeah. When, when you, you reflect perhaps on when there has been success, you know, you, mm. you go back to sort mm. of say, look, you have done this. You can yeah. do this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, another good strategy. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it, it's all a matter of helping the Lord be received, you know, find reception mm -hmm. in them, in what is loving and true and useful. So, so anyway, um, how are we? We're all at my time. Uh, right? 13 minutes. 13 minutes? Oh, good. Crowns. <laughs> You got Brenda's hand. Oh yes, Brenda. Yeah. <laughs> I'm bringing it very back, back very much to the natural. But the start of it, you dropped the plate was dropped. <coughs> now, if it was an old plate and you didn't care about it, your reaction would be one way. And if it was a plate that um, meant the world to, me, <coughs> to you and it was very expensive, you'd have a completely different attitude to it. So, should you have the same attitude as you would to the old plate, you didn't care what happened, or how do you separate that? Um, I, I'll let you guys answer. I was going to say, a lot of it's about the work in yourself before you can oh, help you. somebody, because you, that's the initial thing with all of them, that you have to be looking the Lord yourself first to be properly useful. Because otherwise you do knee-jerk things and you react from, like a parent often, like we did with her. So this Although is a, we did a lot of anger. <laughs> what do you mean knee-jerk things? All the way through the ideas. We all did it. We did it. We did it. The first of charity, the first thing of charity is to shun evils as sins. Namely, is to look at yourself and to deal with this baggage that you have that's getting in the way of your being able to be a servant. So that's a tough one because, yeah, and, and, and it's legitimate in a way when we really cared about that plague, you know, and someone broke it. You know, to, but, but we are dealing with our own feelings there, and probably 10 years later, looking back on this, we're going to be able to say, yeah, but, but how I felt about the plague is not the important thing. And the plate right. is still just a thing, even though it may be a beautiful yeah. thing. Even it's still inherited just a thing. from your great so, grandmother. So and yeah. still <laughs> we love <laughs> others by, first of all, <laughs> by taking care right. of our own stuff. <laughs> yeah. So if you were going to relate, you were looking at the plate <coughs> and its significance <coughs> to us, um, what if the plate belonged to our best friend who just died from cancer? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then you, it, it, it goes on. Yeah. Yeah. Then you blow it together. Let me go back <laughs> to uh, people's response <laughs> to Brenda. <laughs> Andrew, you had a response. Yeah, I was going to say it's only a thing, you know. You have to bear, you have to put things in perspective and make it, you know, ha you, you can't change it. Someone's broken your plate by saying you stupid person or make, making some nasty, angry comment. You're not actually going to bring the plate back. It's, so, you know, so, so you have to accept that the Lord, the Lord let that happen. It's a thing. It just passed. It's had its time. It's done. You know. I mean, I'm sorry, Brenda, but <laughs> great, great grandma's plate. It, it, that's just attachment and wisdom of Andrew. He's going to be able to say, you just okay, say I feel bad, I'm but sorry, but I, you know, it's just. A thing. <laughs> 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 
We're going to get stuck on that. Clearly, this has happened to a lot of people. It has. I don't know. All right. No, no, no. Oh, sorry. The same thing you just said about the plate is the person who's just died from yes, cancer. Right. Okay. It's all right, he's had his time. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, uh, no. I mean, it's... Uh, yeah. I, I'm, just, I'm just wondering whether those plates, you know, is it... Uh, you know, the, the really precious one is, you know, for instance, if somebody has murdered somebody, how, how do you deal with that person? As opposed to this person over here as, as, who's just punched somebody, you know, it, it's a really precious plate that they've broken, or the, you know, it's it's the deed that you're looking at rather than the, the, the thing, you know, and you're having to respond to that <coughs> differently and find a, you know, dig a lot deeper to, yes. to, dig deeper. to, to support that person, mm -hmm. to love that person when it does something terrible, as opposed to not something bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the one stuff I... Okay, Louisa. I, I, I don't want to spend too much time. Well, I, I would think to myself, if someone smashed one of my really good plates, I would actually think to myself, well, perhaps I sh should learn my lesson and put my really good plates somewhere where people can't touch them. And, and I would put really rubbish plates out where people can smash them. Can we lay this to rest? <laughs> <laughs> Can we smash it? Sweep it up, put it in the bin. So I'm really only going to be able to uh, you know, suggest here. Uh, so I was hungry and you gave me food. Who are the hungry? How do we identify them? How do we help them? In general, what do you think? What are signs of spiritual hunger in others? People just being miserable and not, not, not having a direction and um, feeling that everything, everybody is against them. Uh, possibly. It, it, things are often linked. This one in particular mm -hmm. has to do with love, hunger. Um, I was hungry. It's, it's about love, whereas I was thirsty, is about states of truth. Okay, so what, what is, spiritual hunger is, um, you know, not being able to uh, feel love. You, I mean, you can start by showing care for someone who seems to be in a state of unloved, you know, just, mm -hmm. just show that you're concerned. Mm -hmm. And that you listen to them, take time to listen, so that they, they feel that there's some communication and some some someone's showing mm -hmm. interest in them it might help someone who's you know but obviously there are people who are also genuinely hungry in this world or i mean phys physically hungry yeah. different yeah. states of hunger aren't they yeah and th thank you for saying that because and i think someone suggested earlier we have to deal with the natural um, state mm. um, and by all means uh, we need to help the world with hunger, you know, the, the, the hunger mm -hmm. problem. Um, so we're, we're sort of jumping to the spiritual level here. Mm -hmm. Isn't it interesting when we want to show love, we often bring people food. I mean, there's there's this correlation of, yes. yeah. you know, I want to show you I care, here's a pie. Yeah. Um, um, Eric, you put mm -hmm. together this uh, list here of signs of spiritual hunger in others. The person talks about feelings a lot. Um, person feels unaccountably down, a bit depressed. I guess you've touched on that. A person feels distressed at suffering the suffering of others. Uh, all of the signs we look for in ourselves. Um, the person is not actively doing wrong, but feels lack of joy or peace or contentment and wants it. So the person is uh, not actively doing wrong because remember these first three are about people who are in states of you know loving what's good and true. So yeah, so these are the kind of things that might be indications of spiritual. I don't understand D. All of the signs. Yeah. Uh, what, what I mean by that is how, how do you know when you when you want love and affection? You know. What, what, if you looked in yourself and say, what, what, what signs would I give? Right. 
because um, often that's really what we recognize, like, oh, I recognize that face, I've seen it in the mirror, uh, yeah, maybe right. I need to go and do... <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking of in worship when I thought of uh, Elisha putting his face and his hands and his yes. you know, mouth on together. It's just, just the fact that we, being human, um, in looking at ourselves, can know what others need. We can guess. Just, uh, can I tentatively suggest that the vast majority of the population are hungry? Yeah, at times as well. Sometimes it's more overt, sometimes it's hidden, sometimes people don't want to acknowledge that they're hungry. Mm -hmm. I suggest that maybe we should consider everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And probably all the yeah, others. And, and, but, but what about thirsty? Could we say the same thing about that? Yeah, yeah definitely yeah. in this world. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. jumping to uh, signs of thirst in mean, us. Yeah, this is from Eric again. Uh, yearning to know what's true about something, that most important kind of thirst, by far, is the thirst we feel when we want to do something spiritually useful but don't know how mm -hmm. or what to do. So if, we do something, others. if we do something naturally useful, does that also then attend to degrees of the spiritual thirst? So if somebody's hungry, mm -hmm. naturally hungry, and we give them food, mm -hmm. does that not give them an entry to say, oh, that was a nice thing, that person is a, a good person? Mm -hmm. um, therefore have a spiritual relationship to the natural giving of food and drink. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. um, I think it might do, but I mean, we had a guy come to church, he came to Grant and said, uh, I'd love to come to church, when do you serve the food? <laughs> yeah. And uh, clearly it, he, he was only interested in, in coming for the food. And he came for the food, and he had a bit of food. There wasn't much left when he arrived, because he arrived well after service. Okay. And then he left, and we won't see him again, probably until next month when we do feast, and, you know, when we do food again. <laughs> yeah, but he was, he was only a natural... He, yeah. he only seemed to have a natural need. But there are other people who... Well, it's both ways, yeah. 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 I had guessed that that's where he might be, right. and I had told him the day before when he came to talk to me, um, you're welcome to come for the spiritual food and for the natural food. <laughs> but he came only for the natural. Yeah, yeah. He, was, he was clearly in great distress. Yeah. 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 I have experience of a congregation where they did open their doors to all comers for food before the service. And sure, some of them walked out, but some of them stayed. So I. I I do see a very close relationship between attending to people at the natural level mm -hmm. and then infusing the spiritual. Yeah. Like, you know, why do we do this for you? Yeah. For example. Mm -hmm. And you probably need to fun. do it more than once. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So a one-on-one -on -one off probably won't work. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's for this card. So just to say, there is a very successful example of this what you're talking about at the Bradford Church that belongs to the Conference Church. So they have a community program and they now take all those teenagers from the geography to Pearly Chase twice a year. And the leader is amazed at the small ideas that have been implanted that they now believe. Mm -hmm. That we are made to be angels and things like mm -hmm. that. They, and she says, I always think they're just coming for all the fun and everything but she's amazed at what's actually being implanted yeah, through yeah, teaching. It's very yeah. successful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, my time is quickly drawing to a close, and um, I just want to touch on the last one, which is, uh, I was a sojourner, and you took me in. Um, and let me just suggest that, there's, that I love that took me in, because that's sort of uh, it, it, the uh, Greek word there is suinago which means to lead together, to bring together, to gather. Mm. Uh, Suin means, you know, to bring <coughs> a union with together, and other means to lead or to bring. 
It's a really beautiful idea. The synagogue, it comes from that very same word, synagogue, mm -hmm. uh, to bring people together to worship. But um, yeah, in Swedenborg, he uses this word, kaligo, which is to we get collect from that. Kaligio, kaligra. <laughs> um, excuse me. And uh, yeah, the idea is to tie the co ligo to tie together. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, the sojourner. You know, I was thinking of when John was talking of the uh, how we're all hungry and and how intense that was during COVID, when when we all hungered for uh, community. You know, mm -hmm. for for uh, those opportunities to to share and to to give love and. Um, that's related very directly to this, uh, the stranger who's not feeling connected, not, not feeling like they're part of things, mm -hmm. and needs to be brought you know, together so that they can experience the, the Lord. Anyway, just, just one more wonderful category. Now, I'm really hoping, my, my time is done here, but I'm really hoping that Fritz and, and uh, Karen can, uh, in, in their talk, can you know, flesh out some of these things, and, and Eric too, because I think some of the conversation is going to go a similar way and are coming to terms with what, what are these states and how do we serve them and what about this and what about that, you know, and how, how is it changed by this factor or how is it changed by that factor, the anger, or the, you know, um, and that's where all the wisdom is going to come in and hopefully we'll gain some of that together. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.